Welcome everyone to the podcast that's about to blow the lid on some of the biggest financial secrets hiding in plain sight. I'm your host, John McGregor, and today we're diving headfirst into the world's economy. No guests, ask, no guests or exports today, just me uncovering stories that have and will have a serious impact on your financial future that have been carefully woven into our fabric of our society very, very quietly. So buckle up because I want to share things that you may not be aware of because remember, knowledge is power. And together, we will arm ourselves with the truth and stand tall against these forces that seek to keep us struggling financially. Folks, here we go. If you have concerns about your financial future, let's be honest, the world shapes your wallet. We're taking you behind the scenes to look at what's really happening in the real world. Inform, prepare, and empower. This is the Full Disclosure Podcast with your host, John McGregor. Before we dive into these stories, don't forget to hit subscribe below because you don't want to miss out on future episodes. Secondly, I've had a lot of demand for a simple and quick overview of my cash flow and wealth building strategy. So what I did was I took my 40-minute uh, masterclass that I talk about and I boiled, down, I boiled it down to a I think it's less than five minutes. It's a real concise explanation on my cash flow system, and you can check that out at go.johnmcgregor.net. It's go.johnmcgregor.net. You know, it's funny, a close friend of mine said recently, he said, and he's spot on, basically said, you know, it's such a shame for people to not make money online with stocks and options when your 93 year old father does it so easily. And it's just so <laughs> unbelievably true. And both my dad and I were both on an incredible run this year in the market. So, um, and by the way, before we get started, I wanted to share this. I had something amazing happen to me. And you guys, I wonder if you guys have heard of this Acorns investment app. And if you haven't, it's really, really cool. And you got to check it out. So basically, this Acorn app is linked to your debit or your credit cards. And as you make purchases, it rounds up any purchase to the next dollar. And then it invests your spare change and invests it into a diversified portfolio of very low cost ETFs. So I think this is a great idea, by the way. So I set up my account uh, account probably over a year ago, and I linked it to my American Express card. And I really had forgotten about it. And just yesterday, I got an email notification. So I wanted to check out my account, and I found out I've got almost $2,200 that I had no idea I had. $2,200. And it's almost like free money. And I think this would be great for anyone, but particularly someone with kids trying to teach them the idea of saving money and investing it effortlessly by just rounding up your spare change. Um, oh, and by the way, if you're interested, I got a referral link where you can get a $5 bonus just for, just for signing up. So uh, just type ACORN in the comments and I'll be sure you get the link. All right, let's get into these stories. Folks, we are in a financial crisis right now and it's not getting any better. And it goes way deeper than what you think. In fact, it's just getting worse. And the squeeze is on and the powers to be are hiding it from us. Look, we're currently sitting at $34.5 trillion in debt. And get this, take a moment and imagine how fast this debt is growing. It's mind blowing. Our debt is growing by $1 trillion every 100 days. Think about that a trillion dollars every 100 days. I mean, how long can this go before something catastrophic happens? And check out this chart. And for those that are just listening, I'll explain it to you. This chart is just from October of 2022 to the present. October of 2022 to the present. And look at that spike in June of 2023 to the present. I mean, holy crap. That's in just over a little over a year. At $31.5 trillion in June of 2023, it just spikes to where we are now at $34.5 trillion. And now, as I said, we're growing at $1 trillion every 100 days. I mean, that chart is mind-blowing. So that $34.5 trillion, if you break that down, is the equivalent of $267,000 per taxpayer. So every one of us is on the hook for $267,000 and climbing rapidly. And the interest on that debt, just to service it, is costing us, well, you and I, $762 billion just in interest per year and rising. Now, keep in mind as a country, we bring in about $4.5 trillion in revenue. 
So keep that number in mind. 4.5 trillion in revenue. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you today, but it's really, really important you understand this. So again, revenue, $4.5 trillion in revenue every year. So that's $762 billion we have to pay in interest, which again is increasing every single day, just in interest, is the equivalent of 17% of all the revenue we bring in. Folks, this is unprecedented. And at $1 trillion in new debt every 100 days, that interest is going to continue to eat into the revenue we need to survive as a country. The amount we spend on interest is the equivalent of our entire defense budget. Think about that. The amount we spend just on interest on our debt is the equivalent of our entire defense budget. Think about this. Defense spending, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Just those four things represent 57% of the total budget. Now add in the interest we pay to service our debt, which is 17% of the budget. We're now at 74% already accounted for in our budget. That leaves only 26% for everything else we need, which includes agriculture, education, transportation, and veterans benefits, and so many other things. And as the interest on our debt continues to increase and take more money out of the federal budget, all of those programs just get squeezed. And get this one. In the calendar year of 2023, the federal government spent $6.3 trillion. That was the total amount of money they spent on all of these programs. But as I said earlier, remember, we only collected $4.5 trillion in taxes or revenue. That's a $1.8 trillion budget gap or deficit, which is driving our overall debt through the roof, right? And it's only getting higher. And this is spiraling out of control to the point there may not be any return. And no one on either side has the guts or the backbone to cut back on any of the spending. We're going to get into that in a minute. And the only answer, or should I say the only thing they know how to do is to raise taxes and to continue to print more money. And that's all they know how to do, which only compounds the problem. And let's face it. I mean, these politicians have no real life experience, most of them. They've never had to make payroll. They've never had a real job. They've never had to pay employees. They've never built anything or created anything. They've never created a job. And most of them, most of them have been spoon fed their entire life. So what do they care about gouging us for more tax dollars to pay for their spending so they can secure votes for eternity, right? And again, folks, this isn't one or the other party. This is both parties doing this. And all this is going to do is just exasperate the inflation and continue to see these prices of things that we buy and the services continue to rise. Now, let's take it a little further. Right now, our debt to GDP, and GDP is gross domestic product. That's everything that we produce as a country. Our debt to GDP, which is the ratio of how much we produce as a country relative to how much we owe, is 127%. Folks, that's not good. The Congressional Budget Office, otherwise known as the CBO, which is supposed to be a non-biased economic organization, they predict that by 2050, our debt will surpass $50 trillion and put our debt to GDP close to 200%. And at the rate we're growing, our debt, I think $50 trillion dollars would be a dream. I think we'd love to see $50 trillion because I think it's going to be more like $75 or $100 trillion when you're growing your debt at a $1 trillion every 100 days. And that deficit spending, what I just mentioned earlier, we're running that budget deficit of 7% of GDP. In other words, that's roughly $1.8 trillion we spend every year equates to 7% of what we produce. So stay with me here because these numbers are absolutely critical. That budget deficit of 7% of GDP is something we've only done three times since World War II. And those three times we were deep in recession and the unemployment rate was above 7%. Running a budget deficit this large at full unemployment is unheard of. It's insane. Look, Trump ran a big budget deficit and a lot of that had to do with COVID. But this 7% number we have today doesn't even come close to what it was under Trump. But in the end, what does this all mean to all of us, right? Not only a financial crisis that's looming, 
something we've never seen before, but also much higher inflation going forward, a very challenging stock market, bond market, and our currency. And of course, the narrative we constantly hear is that this administration has done a great job, right? Bidenomics is amazing. The Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, is Yoda, right? Whatever they say. And they're toting this notion that, that inflation is coming down. Folks, this is also a very, very important because too many people fall for this media headline. When you hear that inflation is coming down, all that means is that the rate of inflation growth is coming down, slowing down. Inflation is still rising, but just at a slower rate, meaning that the price of things that you buy is still going up and is still extremely high from where it was three years ago. So I saw an interesting inflation analysis and he called it the common man CPI. In other words, the common man consumer price index. And it's really, really interesting and revealing. And what they did was they looked at inflation, but just on things that people actually have to buy, right? The necessities to get an accurate number of what the true inflation number is. So how's that for a novel idea, right? <laughs> Let's study things that we actually need. So they looked at things like, like energy costs, utilities, um, housing, food, gas, as those examples of things that we absolutely need to survive. And they excluded things like vacations, you know, trips to Puerto Rico and uh, new flat screen TVs. In other words, they excluded those things that were not necessities. Because the Bureau of Labor, who keeps track of the inflation number, they have something, something you may have heard of, it's called core inflation, which get this, Core inflation excludes food and energy, and they often use this to hide the true number. So can you imagine core inflation excludes two of the most important things we need to survive, which is food and energy? They, they claim that those two things are too volatile to include in the core inflation. So it's, it's not a accurate reflection of what the actual inflation is. I mean, it's such a scam, and it's so, it's so misleading, it's not even funny. The problem <laughs> is that eating and staying warm is pretty important, right? I would say. So the study showed the common man analysis, common, common uh, man inflation analysis showed that prices have risen far faster than wages by about 7%. And nothing is going to stop this. At least none of the proposals, none of the legislation is going to stop this. So check this chart out showing the cost of the vital things we need to live over the past three years. And again, if you're driving, don't watch this. I'll, it's a really simple chart I'll explain. It's showing going back 36 months or three years, rent is up 19.5%. Groceries, 21.1%. Energy is up 32.3%. Gas up 34.6%. And mortgage payments are up a whopping 66.5%. I mean, no wonder people can't afford to buy a house today. And all you hear, all you hear is that inflation is coming down. Again, folks, inflation is not coming down. The rate of inflation growing is slowing down, but nothing, nothing is eating into these high costs. They are still rising just at a slower rate. And I hope everyone understands that because it's super important that you do. And even, by the way, even Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury, acknowledged in testimony that these high prices are going to be with us for a very, very long time, if not forever. And they still want to print more money to prop up this economy and the stock market, especially now, given that it's an election season. And all that means is just higher inflation on things we buy, things that we need. And who gets screwed the most? It's always the middle class. And the people in charge today, they talk about this concept called MMT. You may have heard of this. In other words, modern monetary theory. And if you hear this term, MMT or modern monetary theory, your ears perk up because this is an absolute train wreck and will lead us to an economic collapse if this continues. Oh, and by the way, notice I say if this continues because this is what they're doing right now. There is nothing modern about modern monetary theory. And this isn't monetary at all. And lastly, it's a horrible theory. That does not work. In fact, it only makes things worse. Modern monetary theory, MMT, is basically the idea that you can spend whatever you want, 
if you're the reserve currency, which we are here in the US, since we have the US dollar, which is the world's reserve currency. And folks, there is nothing modern about spending money you don't have. Also, it's important you understand how this budget blowout works. This is an absolute shell game. They play on both sides of the political aisle. And so here's what happens. Take, for example, a government agency, right? And they spent $100 billion in the current year, in the current budget, right? And they want to take that up to $120 billion a year. So what do they do? They request in their upcoming budget $140 billion. And then they ultimately arrive at $120 billion, their ultimate goal, right? I want to repeat that because it's really important you see this concept. And I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. I apologize. But I want to get this concept so you understand how, the, how this government scam actually works. You have a government agency. They spent $100 billion in the current year. That was their budget, right? And they really want to take that up to $120 billion this upcoming year. So they request in their upcoming budget $140 billion, $20 billion over what they really want. And again, they ultimately arrive at their goal of $120 billion. But here's the scam. So instead of saying we added 20 billion to our budget, they spin it by saying, look how great we are. We saved the American taxpayer $20 billion because we didn't get our 140 billion. We only got 120. <laughs> In other words, this is a common shell game the government uses every single year to spend more and more money, but then spin it as if they're saving us taxpayer dollars. Can you follow me here? And this is the game they've been doing for years on both sides, and they'll come out with some big outlandish proposed number that they know they'll never get. And then they scale it back and then say, wow, see all the money we're saving you, how great we are? I mean, it's just unbelievable. The other thing that's costing you and I billions of dollars every single year is this use it or lose it phenomenon. Use it or lose it phenomenon. And again, it's it's nothing new. It's another trick in, in their bag. In the last month of every fiscal year, federal agencies will spend all that's left in their annual budget. Because if they don't spend all of their money in their budget, these agencies will worry that their budget will be cut by the amount they didn't spend. Hence the use it or lose it spending spree. So rather than an agency admit at the end of the year, hey, we really don't need all this money, we didn't spend it, they go out and spend it on frivolous items. It's like Christmas in September for the federal government. And the Department of Defense, I have to admit, is the worst at this. You know, there's, there's, and there's tons of examples of this. But for example, the Department of Defense, they dropped $4.6 million on crab and lobster and $9,000 on an office chair in a last minute spending spree. Can you imagine? $4.6 million on crab and lobster and nine grand on an office chair. They also splurged on $7.6 million worth of workout equipment. Another agency spent $300,000 on steak, including ribeyes and top sirloins, when they didn't need to at all. I mean, as I said, there's a ton of examples of this, but this happens all the time. This is the use it or lose it spending spree. Like I said, Christmas is in September, that's just wasting billions of billions of dollars of our hard-earned money. And I personally think the only way that we're going to solve this or, or get this solved or severely improved, I should say, is if they go to something called a zero base budget, zero base budget, which means all expenses must be justified for a brand new year, brand new budget. And all the different budgets must start at zero and a new budget from scratch is created. No simple add ons to the previous budget. I think that's the only way that we're going to we're going to get to the bottom of this and really put a dent into this into this uh, federal debt that we're that we're just growing at an astronomical rate. So just to wrap up this segment, you know, it, it, it's sad and funny. I sit in the sun every single day after my workout and I have conversations with people of all walks of life and all demographics. And I like to bring up this topic of the economy because most people don't have a clue what's going on. And I understand, you know. I don't expect people who are working hard, trying to raise families, put food on the table to follow this stuff as closely as I do, because this is what I do for a living, right? But it still fascinates me how little people know, and it's actually scary, frankly. And when I share these numbers that I just covered with you, most of you look at me with a blank stare. They shrug their shoulders and they say, well, who cares? It doesn't affect me. I mean, it's crazy. And, and now, 
I will say, I, I, things are bad, but I don't foresee an economic collapse or a crashing stock market anytime soon. Hopefully. In fact, I think they can keep kicking the can down the road for the next two to five years, maybe even 10 years before anything catastrophic happens. But I'll tell you what, when it does, it's going to be big. Think total collapse of the economic system. And this won't even compare to what we saw in 07. One day, these people are going to wake up and realize, these people who really have no care at all in this stuff, they're going to wake up and realize how significant this is when they're now paying over 50% in taxes, when they suddenly lose their job, their pension was slashed, their 401k was cut in half or more, their social security check was now cut by over 30 to 50%. Food supplies are minimal. Medical care is extremely hard to get, and you won't be able to fight, afford to, you won't be able to afford to drive your car or heat your home and so many other things. But until then, most people will will bury their head in the sand as both parties continue. Both parties now will continue to print and spend more money on things we don't need, give out more handouts domestically and around the world just to secure their political power. I'm telling you folks, a day of reckoning is coming and it's coming fast. And this is not meant to scare you. That is not my intention at all. This is meant to awaken you to a reality so you're prepared or getting prepared. And that's why financial education is so, so vitally important. And that's why it's so important to take control of your own financial future and not rely on somebody else. And that's why I commend you for watching this show and others. All right, so let's move on. We got a lot more to cover. Here's a really interesting story from a guy named Art Laffer. And he's one of the most prominent economists of our times. And he was was a major player during Reagan's presidency as a top economic policy advisor. And he's regularly, still to this day, sought of sought for for his expert uh, opinion on the economy. And one of the things he's most known for is what's called the Laffer curve, which is it's really a powerful yet simple graph to determine the appropriate level of taxes and tax revenue. And it kind of incorporates a, a people's psychology of incentives. It's really interesting. And he's always been a big proponent of lower taxes and how historically lower taxes or lowering taxes has always, let me repeat, always led to higher federal revenue. That's just a fact. It may sound contrary. You'd think raising raising taxes would bring in more federal revenue. No, it's the absolute opposite. And a lot of people in the media and politicians argue against this, this known fact because they love higher taxes and control over our wallets. But again, if you look at the facts and look at any time where presidents who lowered taxes And that would include Republicans and Democrats, including John F. Kennedy, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and now Trump. Whenever taxes were lowered, it always, always stimulated growth, incentivized people to invest, which always led to a rise in revenue to the federal government. But of course, people on the left hate this fact because they love higher taxes. So they argue against it no matter the fact they have no backing behind their argument. And a myth they often cite as the reason against lowering taxes is that lowering taxes only helps the rich. And you'll hear them gaslight terms like tax cuts for the rich, which is just not true. And I'm going to show you why in just a moment. So this was an interesting report that came out titled, The Data Proves It, The Trump Tax Cuts Soaked the Rich. In other words, the Trump tax cuts hurt the rich, which is contrary to what the left says, right? Because they always say uh, tax cuts help the rich. But no, this graph clearly shows that lowering tax rates actually hurts the rich rather than helps them. And let me just show you. And here's the chart that debunks that entire narrative showing the top marginal tax rates on the left side of the graph. And at the bottom is a timeline going back to when Reagan took office in 1980 all the way through 2023. And let me explain it to you. So back when Reagan became president, the top income tax rate in the United States stood, stood at 70%. 70%. And the wealthiest 1%, and by the way, we were in a massive recession when he took office. And the wealthiest 1% of taxpayers at that time paid roughly 19% of all income taxes collected. So just keep that in mind. In 1980, the top 1% of income earners, the very wealthy, paid 19% of all income taxes collected. But then Reagan came in 
and initially slash that rate down to 50% and eventually landing it at 28% by 1987. So again, Reagan came in, highest tax rate was 70%, and roughly seven years later, he got it down to 28%. Surprisingly, even though the rich were paying less in tax percentage-wise, they were actually contributing more in taxes. So even though their tax rate dropped to 28%, the top 1% were now paying around 35% of all tax revenue. Crazy, right? So fast forward to today, and even though the top tax rate for the wealthy is at 37%, the top 1% of earners are footing almost 50% of the total tax bill. Let me restate that. Now that the top tax rate for the high earners, the one percenters, is at 37%, those top 1% income earners are now responsible for 50% of all taxes collected. And let me throw you another one. The top 20% of earners, of income earners, top 20% of income earners pay 80% of all taxes collected. So when you hear this nonsense that the rich don't pay their fair fair share, it's just a flat out lie. The numbers speak for themselves. So when you, whenever you hear someone saying that the rich don't pay their fair share, make sure you pull out that statistic that the top 1% pays half of all taxes and sit back and see how they squirm out of that one. My personal take, <clears throat> take on income taxes is this. If you want to be absolutely fair, by definition, all taxpayers would pay the exact same dollar amount. In other words, everyone would pay, say, $500 or $1,000, whatever that number is. Everyone would pay the exact same dollar amount. Just like all of us pay the same, uh, regardless of income, we pay the same amount for gas, milk, Netflix subscriptions, right? Why wouldn't we all pay the exact same dollar amount for taxes if we want to be absolutely fair? The next level of fairness, if that didn't work, which it probably wouldn't, it wouldn't actually, because 50% of people don't even pay taxes at all. The next level of fairness would be this. How about we all pay the same percentage of our income? In other words, this is the flat tax that you may have heard that so many people, including many brilliant economists, and one being Art Laffer, who I just mentioned, that have done that analysis and have pushed hard for. So in this case, with a flat tax, We'd all pay about 15% of our income or 20% of our income. I think the number they're actually pushing for is around 18% that we would all pay on our income. I mean, this is what they do in other countries, including Hong Kong, and it's worked very, very well. Look, there'd be no tax loopholes, no more deductions, no more silly tax schemes. And you'd be able to basically fill out your tax return on a postcard that would take you 10 minutes instead of 10 hours that it does today. And you wouldn't have to pay an accountant hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to do this for you. But instead, we have this progressive tax system where the tax rate increases as you make more money, which is basically punishing you for working harder to make more money and be more successful, right? And by the way, that flat, flat tax idea has been talked about for years. And every study and analysis that I've seen shows that it would lower the overall tax bur burden for most taxpayers, especially the middle class, while generating even more revenue for the federal government than our current progressive tax system by far. And by the way, on a side note, doesn't it just blow your mind that our tax code and regulations, which is over 75,000 pages, yeah, you heard me correctly. Our tax code and the regulations, 75,000 pages, is so complicated and so convoluted that you have to hire somebody to do your taxes for you in most cases. And by the way, despite the complexity of our tax system, you know this, if you do something wrong, you're in big, big trouble. And good luck trying to reach somebody at the IRS with a question. Oh, by the way, I just read this in prep for the show. On the IRS website, irs.gov, an individual taxpayer is estimated to spend 13 hours just to prepare and file one annual tax return. 13 hours, which means if you add it all up, Americans will spend 6.5 billion hours on income taxes. I mean, what a complete waste of time, not to mention costs. It's, just, it's unbelievable. So on this subject of the federal budget, this is interesting. 
and scary and sad. <laughs> Do you want to know the fastest growing component of our budget is? The fastest growing component of our budget. It's fraud. That's right, fraud. I mean, it's stuff like this that just pisses me off and should piss you off as well, especially as we approach taxis and knowing that so much of our taxes that we all work hard for is just wasted and stolen. And I wouldn't be so furious about the amount of taxes I pay or we all pay if we knew it was being used efficiently and without corruption. I mean, when I see we're spending money, millions of dollars to study, I don't know, penguins mating with iguanas in Thailand. I mean... And I'll admit, I just made that up. It infuriates me. And by the way, that, that is not far from reality. In fact, just for fun, I looked it up. These are actual government expenditures in 2023. Get this. This is where your tax dollars are going. The government spent $518,000 to study how cocaine affects the sexual behavior of Japanese quail. I'm serious. $518,000 on a study how cocaine affects the sexual behavior of Japanese quail. The National Institute of Health spent $2.7 million to study Russian cats walking on a treadmill. For real. The Department of Defense ruined over $170 million worth of military equipment by leaving it outside. In 2022, the Pentagon, the Pentagon cannot account for $220 billion worth of government gear provided to military contractors. The U.S. government spent $6 million to boost tourism. Sounds great, right? But it was in Egypt. $6 million to promote tourism in Egypt. In 2023, the government spent $38 million on benefits for people that are no longer alive. And lastly, the Small Business Administration, which is a government-run organization, spent over $200 million to support local concert venues when they were forced to shut down during the pandemic. Pandemic. I mean, that sounds noble, right? But check this out. Entertainers like Chris Brown, he received $10 million. Lil Wayne received $9 million. Smashing Pumpkins received $8.6 million. Usher, $3.1 million. Melissa Etheridge, $3.9 million. And so many other entertainers that I've never heard of, because as my wife says, I'm totally mainstream impaired. So I guess my original example of penguins mating with iguanas in Thailand wasn't so far fresh. I mean, it's just so infuriating. And get this one. The study by the Heritage Foundation found erroneous payments by programs from Medicare to Medicaid to food stamps to the COVID PPP program have grown by more than 500% over the past 16 years. Erroneous payments grown by 500%. And the answer we will never hear is we're gonna get to the bottom of this, which they never do, and no one is ever held accountable for any of this stuff. And the answer is, as always, we just got to raise, raise taxes to fund these expenses. I'm pretty sure if they cut half of the corruption and the waste of government spending, they could easily lower our taxes and significantly raise revenue. But frankly, that would be way, way too much work. I mean, I, 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 someone needs to tell government that before they call again to soak the rich... How about finding these fraudsters and getting our money back? I mean, just in Medicare, there's $47 billion in overpayments. There was $81 billion in overpayments for Medicaid. It's just 2022. It's just absolutely disgraceful. All right, folks, our last and most outrageous story in my mind. Well, I should say it's the most outrageous. But this last story is outrageous, but again, not surprising. And here's the lowdown. My wonderful state of California is hiking up the minimum wage for fast food workers to 20 bucks an hour starting next month, which is just going to crush restaurants and hit it where it hurts, which is right in their wallet. But, it, but of course, it's not just going to hit the restaurants. It's going to hit the workers as well. This is no more than a political scheme to attract more younger voters. Whenever you raise the minimum wage, businesses cut back on hours. They hire fewer people. They automate the systems. They need fewer workers. I mean, just go to a McDonald's and they've got electronic kiosks to take your orders. No more people. Businesses will often close locations or they even close down in general or they'll move their business out of those states, which, by the way, is happening fast here in California as hundreds, hundreds of businesses are closing shop every single year and moving to more business friendly states, all under this political BS narrative that they're trying to help people when, in fact, it actually hurts 
businesses and individuals. There was a Twitter post. Well, I guess you call it an X post now, right? That was it's still going viral today. A guy who posted it went into a Five Guys burger joint. He ordered a bacon cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. With a $2 tip, his total bill was $24.10. <laughs> cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke, $2 tip, $24.10. I had a similar experience not too long ago. So the other day I was pressed for time and I went into a McDonald's. I ordered a simple cheeseburger and a small fries. That's it. No drink. Cheeseburger, those small little cheeseburgers, fries, small fries, no drink, $8.62. I mean, fast food is now becoming a luxury because of these regulations that they're putting on small businesses. Look, fast food was never designed, or a fast food job was never designed to be a career move, and it's not meant to support a family. It's where you get started, where you learn some basic skills, some discipline. It's not meant to be a career for most people. Yet some people, I agree, they climb the ranks, they become managers, general managers, go into corporate, get their own franchise, which is amazing. But that rarely ever happens. So anyway, here's the kicker to the story. When our governor, Gavin Newsom, enacted this $20 minimum wage, he decided to sneak in a little loophole for the Panera Bread franchises. These are these casual restaurants that sell soups and salads and sandwiches and some baked goods, right? And they're all over California and perhaps elsewhere outside of California. So Gavin Newsom snuck in a little loophole for the Panera Bread franchise because, get this, they bake their own bread. So because because they bake their own bread, they're not subject to the $20 minimum wage. Interesting, right? But wait, here's something really, really interesting. Coincidentally, one of Gavin's best friends and big-time political contributor is this billionaire, Greg Flynn, who, get this, he happens to own 137 Panera locations. Huh. So according to the California Globe, Flynn and Newsom, they go way back. They went to the same high school, right? And they've been involved in some business deals together. And get this, Flynn has dropped over $160,000 into Newsom's campaign coffers. Oh, and there's more. Flynn's net worth is about $1.1 billion, and and he's been tossing cash at Newsom's campaign like it's confetti. So interesting how Newsom carves out a provision that Panera Bread, these franchises, are no longer um, uh, subject to this $20 minimum wage. Just Is that a coincidence? I, I, I don't know. Well, it turns out the cat got out of the bag and Newsom got caught trying to help his big political donor. And folks aren't too happy about this shady arrangement. And now he's scrambling to do some damage control. So we'll see if that gets reversed. (laughs) I swear to these people, they don't even care. They're so blatant about it, they don't even care. Check out this soundbite. There were some discussions around bakeries and this and that. But in relationship to this story, it's absurd. Well, you said it absurd, but when somebody brought that to your attention earlier. There's a provision in this bill that exempts bakeries, carving out essentially Panera and Boudin. I mean, that's part of the sausage making that was part of 257, the original bill. And we went back and forth and there was part of the negotiation. It's the nature of negotiation. Well, it's part of the sausage making. It's a coincidence that this new minimum wage law did not impact a campaign contributor of yours. It does impact the restaurant. It's just absolutely classic, especially with the Curb Your Enthusiasm music at the end. All right, folks, I hope you liked the show. I hope it was informative. I hope it woke you up to, to what's really going on behind the scenes. So to keep this show going, please forward this out to your friends and family and comment below. It really, really helps. we got to get this information to out, out to as many, many people to save this country, to save our economy. Also, don't, hit, don't forget to hit subscribe. Leave a comment below. I'd love to hear your comments, even the insulting ones. I think they're hilarious. Also, you can check out that quick video I mentioned on my cash flow system. It's at go, uh, go.johnmcgregor.net. And if there's a, by the way, if there's a story that you want me to cover or a story that I should know, please send it to me and I'll check it out. With that, we'll see you next time. Have a great week. Aloha. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and supporting Full Disclosure. 
If you like this episode, remember to like and subscribe and follow Full Disclosure. To make a better financial plan for your future, join our Cashflow Bootcamp, where John shows you a safe and smart way to turn your investments into a steady income stream in a fraction of your time. Learn to make money in any market. Until next time. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.